Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jessica, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you, and as always, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our museum members and those tuning into our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. Tonight, we are here to discuss the current state of Islamist jihadi terrorism in Africa. Often media attention and contemporary narratives are focused on groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the Middle East or attacks carried out in Western nations. However, ISIS and Al-Qaeda affiliates like Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, as well as other independent jihadi groups, have been planning and conducting terrorist attacks across the African continent for years. We are fortunate enough to have with us here tonight two experts who will help unpack this significant and complex topic. Dr. Mohammed Fraser Rahim is an expert on violent extremism issues and a scholar on Africa. He is currently the executive director of Quilliam in North America and is an assistant professor in the Citadel's Department of Intelligence and Security Studies in Charleston. Um, Mohammed's areas of specialty are on transnational terrorist movements, Islamic intellectual history, Muslim communities in the West, and Africa affairs. Previously, Mohammed worked for the United States government for more than a decade in the Department of Homeland Security, Director of National Intelligence, and the National Counterterrorism Center. There, he provided strategic advice and executive branch analytical support on violent extremism issues to the White House and the National Security Council, where he was co-author or author of Presidential Daily Briefs and Strategic Assessments on Extremist Ideology. Mohammed earned his PhD in 2017 from Howard University in African Studies with a focus on Islamic thought and on violent extremism issues. Katie Zimmerman is a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the research manager for their Critical Threats Project. As a senior analyst studying terrorist groups, she focuses on the global Al-Qaeda network and covers Salafi jihadi movement and related trends in the Middle East and Africa. And Africa. She also specializes in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, and Al-Qaeda in the Sahel. Um, Katie has testified before Congress about the threats to U.S. national security interests emanating from Al-Qaeda and its network. She has also briefed members of Congress, their staff, and members of the defense community. Her analyses have been widely published, including in CNN.com, The Huffington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. She graduated with distinction from Yale University with a bachelor's in political science and modern Middle East studies. We'd like to thank both of our scholars here for sharing their stories um, and insights with us tonight. Before we begin, I just ask that you take a moment to silence or mute your electronic devices. There is no need to record this program. All of our recordings are online at 911memorial.org slash live. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mohammed Fraser Rahim and Katie Zimmerman in conversation with Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs, Noah Rausch. Thank you, Jess, and I want to echo her thanks and welcome you both. Uh, we're excited to have you, and we say this every program, but we have a lot to cover today. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to jump right in. And I want to start with a 30,000-foot look at the current state of terrorism uh, in Africa. We've had tens of thousands uh, killed. We've had many more than that displaced. We had an attack last week in Mogadishu that killed over 50 people. Um, so Catherine, we'll start with you. And you know, Who are the key groups, and where are they operating? The key groups in Africa are Al-Shabaab, which is responsible for that attack in Mogadishu. It was recognized as an Al-Qaeda affiliate in 2012, but had connections to Al-Qaeda long before that. Uh, you can jump across and, and go to Nigeria in the Lake Chad Basin, where we have Boko Haram, and actually an Islamic State affiliate there as well, Islamic State West Africa, uh, which splintered off of Boko Haram. Moving north in the Sahel, we have both the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda operating there, um, Islamic State um, in the Greater Sahara, and JNIM, which is effectively uh, the conglomeration of a series of four different smaller Salafi jihadi groups that receives direct support from Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Um, AQIM, Al-Qaeda and the Islam Islamic Maghreb, excuse me, uh, has always operated out of Algeria, but it has support zones inside of Mali, uh, parts of Tunisia and Libya as well. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS have networks that run across North Africa. And then we also have Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State inside of Egypt, though much smaller. Um, the Islamic State is quite strong in the Sinai. So what we're looking at is a network of Salafi jihadi groups. And I talked about very distinct groups, but they are really connected in terms of 
sharing resources and expertise and even fighters at times that runs across Africa in a really pivotal triangle. Um, and I know that Mohammed knows this much better than I in terms of the smuggling routes and, and why these groups are where they are. I'm curious, Mommy, how does this track from the situation when you were in government? And even before that, you know, we had the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania in the mid-90s. Bin Laden was in Sudan. In the, you know, we had uh, Black Hawk Down as well. And so is this an extension of an existing fight, or is this something fundamentally new? No, I mean, I think that this is, I think the most ex interesting thing about it is that a lot of these extremist groups have been trying to connect the pre-colonial jihad with the contemporary jihad. Um, and what do we talk about when we, t when we mention the pre-colonial jihad? Uh, first and foremost is that Islamic civilizations have been thriving, they have flourished uh, beyond just Timbuktu. We certainly, in the American sort of school systems, we hear sort of this framing that Timbuktu is this long and dusty place, but it was a place of intellectual learning and engagement. Agadez, also in Mali, uh, sorry, um, excuse me, also in West Africa, we also have Shinkiti that's in Mauritania. And so these historical places are, uh, are places of West African Islamic scholarship that were thriving equally with their counterparts in the, so in the Middle East, in Baghdad, in Iraq, or in Damascus, Syria. And so as you can imagine, there was uh, resistance between uh, uh, colonial regimes, whether the French or the British or other European um, entities, and many of these Islamic communities were resisting in trying to create a reform movement. And so speed up um, to the contemporary times, and we have the reality of groups like Boko Haram who have sought to use that language and that rhetoric to connect to the past glory to the contemporary times. And I would just add another layer to this as well. If you look at an organization like Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghrib, um, it was considered the quintessential AQ franchise because it was able to provide basic services in the, two, in the early 2000s and it was able to uh, carry out a franchise like McDonald's or Burger King. And because of that reality, they were able to uh, have KFR, kidnapping for ransom payments, that were upwards in the millions of dollars that European and also we saw many Asian nations that would pay for. But there was an offshoot group also known as Mujao or Tawijua, Tawhida with Jihad in West Africa. And this is connecting with the historical. And in their statements, in their opening statements, they used the reference of this. We are the ideological descendants of Al-Hajj Umar, Usman Don Forio, and they listed a number of others. Who's Al-Hajj Umar? This is a historical figure in Islamic history who many West Africans, regardless of whether they're Muslim or not, or who are engaged in violent activity or not, they know about this individual. Uh, Sheikh Usman Don Forio is well known. Al-Hajj Umar Tal, the same thing. And so you have individuals like Abu Bakr Shakao, who were using this sort of means and this technique to say, hey, guess what? We need to be the vanguards, the contemporary vanguards of these individuals of the past, and we need to do it in a fashion that shows our legitimacies and our, our, the legitimacy of what we're doing, and then also that we are very much aware of the historical realities of the past. And I think within that, that allows us all who are observers as analysts to understand how these groups operate how they take deep, meticulous, surgical understanding of the past to also dictate how they want to move forward in the future. So they're looking to the past, at the glories of the past, but they also seem to be trying to disrupt these old historical bonds that have tied these communities together for hundreds and thousands of years. And so, you know, most of the victims are Muslim victims. And so how much of that is a conscious strategy on their part to try to uh, destroy these local communities? So this is, I mean, this is, I think the, even the more interesting thing about it, because you have in 2013 AQIM coming into Mali and going into and destroying a rich civilization of UNESCO World Heritage Sites at Jigenbeer and Sidi Yahya, well known for, uh, for, they were places where many of us studied. As a, West, a student in college, I studied in West Africa, in Senegal, in Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia, and I went there, and it was fine. It was, the Dakar Rally was there. Um, and so these individuals are very much aware of the sort of the strategy to, um, to, be, to be mindful of trying to appeal to different audiences as well. And I think that what, what, what makes it even more unique is that um, they have gone into these local populations and tried to impose what they think is an interpretation of what Islam should or shouldn't be. Um, and 
but these communities have been surviving for centuries. And so you hear sort of this, and particularly in 2013, this sort of engagement of saying, hey, what are we doing? Should we be doing this? And now we have declassified reports that are out there and certainly individuals who have uh, done the, the really uh, deep dive of understanding what they're saying, that in fact, uh, groups are learning from that. Boko Haram, the Islamic State in West Africa, maybe our strategy should be, we should be trying to win the hearts and minds of local population. Maybe we should not just go in and destroy tombs or mausoleums and say that all Sufis are bad, or all quote unquote moderate Muslims who don't subscribe to our interpretation, uh, that they aren't right. Um, so I think that groups are adjusting their learning of what's taking place in Pakistan. They're, they're communicating, they're dialoguing, and I think within the African space too as well, uh, certainly violent extremism I think is on the rise. And I think it's likely because of that because these organizations are, um, are able to adapt in environments that have forest borders. But we'll get into that. I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, I do want to come back to that um, idea. And, you know, we mentioned fighters. Are these local individuals? Are these folks coming in from the outside to sort of fight the fight against these communities? Or are they radicalizing individuals within the, um, you know, the, the individual sites and communities? The way that these groups are getting into the community is by starting with somebody inside. Uh, and it usually is somebody who has uh, converted to Salafi Islam, so decided that Salafi Islam is, is the right way and has moved down the spectrum to actually becoming what I call a Salafi Jihadi. So somebody who believes both in Salafism, which is the uh, kind of more conservative form of Islam that believes that uh, Muslims should go back to the way that Islam was practiced uh, during the, the time of the Prophet Muhammad. It doesn't mean giving up technology, mm -hmm. but going back to the roots of the religion and that it's actually obligatory on them as individuals to ensure that this comes about and to do that through violence. And this is really where they run into uh, the, the questions of becoming terrorists uh, because they start to see the use of violence as a means to achieve their ends. Um, but it, it starts with an individual and we can look at every single group and there is somebody there that had be originally been a Salafi Jihadi who received support <laughs> and began to grow his following. Um, and this is true for Boko Haram, where the founder of Boko Haram went to Saudi Arabia, received training, came back, and then started his group in, in Nigeria. This is true for Somalia as well, where we had actually Saudi schools, Wahhabi schools coming in and converting individuals and starting that pocket. And then they received external support. Uh, and the same thing goes for uh, Western Africa and Northern Africa. Um, that being said, it's not foreign. And this is what makes the threat so dangerous, is that, uh, as Muhammad was pointing out, the groups are really trying to embed within the communities, and they're using this framework of taking the, the, way, the glory days and pointing out that life today is not what was promised to the people, that the, the contract that they had with the state has really not been fulfilled, that the state is exploiting them, abandoning them, marginalizing them, and that part of it is because um, of their political, or their, not political identity, but actually their ethnic identity or their religious identity. And we can, use inc we can look at incredibly smart and creative ways that Al-Qaeda in particular has used uh, those identities to insinuate itself in, into the group. So just looking at how Al-Qaeda really spread in Mali, and, and this is kind of a key example where... As Muhammad mentioned, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb had been a, a key franchise for the Al-Qaeda global organization. It ran kidnappings for ransom, and its key hostage neg negotiator um, was this fellow called, is this fellow, called Iyad al And he is now the head of Al-Qaeda in Mali um, and runs a, an Al-Qaeda-associated group called Ansar al um, But Iyad al is an elder and highly respected in his community. And it was through his support to another individual in central Mali who was Fulani. So Iyad Agali is Tuareg. Um, he's from a particular side of the Tuareg, um, the Ifogas, I believe. And he reached out to another individual who'd been fighting with him and gave him support to spread into central Mali, Mali among the Fulani and Mopti. So um, this individual, uh, Ahmed Kufa, is now heading another group called the Messina Liberation Front. 
and he's fighting for the liberation of the Fulani. So we have a Tuareg insurgency and now a Fulani insurgency inside of Mali, both stoked and supported through Al-Qaeda. Um, and over time, Kufa, Kufa's insurgency has become one of jihad. Originally, it was one for the Fulani, and over time, he isolated the Christians from the Muslims, and now his core group is among the, the Muslim Fulanis. And that's just the danger that we have because the, the state response is to crack down on terrorism. So the state response is to a military one against these groups, um, which has added additional natives to their fighting forces because as a community, you're, you're working there and then you see the military come in and the military does not have a gentle touch. Uh, and it adds grievances and so the recruitment is there and ready for the groups. I want to get to policy um, in a moment, but before I want to sort of take a step back and look at some of these governance vacuums that really sort of feed these groups, and I want to look specifically at the Arab Spring, which seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, just sort of this inflection point. Obviously, things ex existed before, but it served as a moment where these governance vacuums really um, expanded. And so I'm curious if you could speak to that, and then we'll get into policy um, from that. Yes, we can. We can blame the Arab Spring for a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, but I think that. You know, as I mentioned, the Tuareg rebellion is really what set off the spread of, of Al Qaeda uh, inside of Mali, and it came out of Libya. Um, it was, some might say that it was inevitable. This is not the first Tuareg rebellion that we've had. Um, it's the first time that we've had a Tuareg rebellion alongside this really massive spread of insecurity um, and the idea that the states are not able to sustain themselves and the questioning of what your relationship with the capital really should be. Um, there was a contest for control of the state previously, and now it's a contest for who actually determines what, what government you're part of. And I think that's what's being missed today, is we still morsel out the conflict so that there's a conflict in Mali, and there's one in Libya, and there's one in Tunisia, and there's one in parts of Niger, and one now in parts of Burkina Faso, and one in Nigeria, and you can go on and on and on, and another one in Cameroon. Um, but they're all interrelated, and they're interrelated because the map, the political map that we have, doesn't actually map to the communities on the ground. And it's the communities now saying, following post-Arab Spring, but really grievances that were there before and just needed to be shot off, um, you know, hey, we have rights. We have grievances against the government, and we've been promised these reparations, we've been promised this governance, for how many decades now? And they're, they're looking at the opportunity to take things into their hands. And you know, frankly, some of the way that the Tuareg Rebellion was dealt with has spurred others to rise up because of the concessions that were given to certain groups that actually waged the insurgency. So you know, in that moment of um, you know, asking for rights and then them not being fulfilled, can you just sort of walk us through, you know, both of you just sort of what that process actually looks like, um, something that isn't uh, along sort of jihadi lines, Salafi jihadi lines to begin with, that sort of gets there over time. Um, and you talked about that a little bit, but I wonder if you could expand on it. I think that you know when you look at Somalia, for example, and in the, the conflict in Somalia has been going on since the overthrow of the Said Bar regime in the early 1990s. Uh, Ash Shabab, Al Qaeda's affiliate, came onto the scene in around 2005, 2006, the start date can be argued. Um, but the, the way that al-Shabaab has been able to extend has been through the capture of some minority clans. And these are grievances that minority clans have held for a very long time. Um, the layering of various civil wars in Somalia has meant that land has changed hands at least three times. There was the landholders under the Siad Bari regime that many viewed as illegitimate, but they have papers. There are those that got the land right after the Civil War uh, who are sitting on top of the land now. And then there are those who have historical claims to the land. All of this is stoking grievances. And the issue with land rights in Somalia comes down to where uh, the watering holes are or where you can graze your herds. And so it actually is a life or death situation for many people, and they will fight for it. Um, and al Shabab has used that desire to have access to a watering well, for example, to say to a, a local elder, if you fight for us, you will have, this, you have access to this water. And it's a very pragmatic relationship. 
the benefits are that the minority clan gets protection. Many times it becomes a power broker in the, in the region where it wasn't before. And you know, I will frankly say that uh, in areas that where al-Shabaab has been cleared over the past five years, there are reports that criminality has returned. Um, and so some of the people saw a lot of benefit to the way that al-Shabaab governed, not its ideology, but the day-to-day -day life that they enjoyed, um, where no, you know, criminality was punished and it was looked down upon. And today the security forces just don't have the bandwidth to deal with it the way the Shabab did. I would just add to as well as I think that um, just to amplify the points uh, that my colleague mentioned is that, you know, the Al-Shabaab's ascendancy also was a result of the Ethiopian invasion. Uh, AQIM's ascendancy is their grievances against the Algerian government. Um, Boko Haram's rise and ascendancy is a result of the Nigerian government not listening to the concerns of individuals who are in far distant places in the East, right? And, and also the reality of this tension, this relationship just in Nigeria between the, the, uh, this, this concept of indirect rule, direct rule you're certainly familiar with, and uh, basically supporting northern elites. And then those who are in um, what would be the equivalent of where we see the stronghold of Boko Haram, they were marginalized. And so this sort of tension of not sort of engaging with these populations also has given rise to this long-standing frustration. And extremist groups, if you just look and do a content analysis on someone like Shakao, and, um, and, and so my organization we work with, particularly at Quilliam, is that you know, everyone on staff has to speak a foreign language. That's my requirement. Um, you need to be able to read and be able to dissect to understand what individuals are actually saying. And if you look at what uh, just some of the statements um, of just the antagonization between the two, uh, the Giwa barracks, certainly probably familiar with, this was one of the barracks that, were, that was attacked. Um, Nigerian government facility. And in, uh, in Hausa, Giwa means elephant. Um, and in uh, Hausa, Adele means pig. So you can, you can imagine what, what Shakao is doing. In his statements, he speaks in fluent classical Arabic. Arabic is his third, potentially fourth, fifth language. He has other languages. He's Kunuri, he has Hausa. He has some English, and he's using that to also reverse what he feels is an atrocity that had been committed against not just him, but those who also have been marginalized in this area, particularly um, in, the, in, the, in the East. That's, that just shows you the level of sophistication that these groups are going to, and also just some layer to the grievances that, um, that my colleague already mentioned as well. So as long as... You know, these groups always have a message as long as these grievances exist. And so I'm curious, how, you know, how much does our foreign policy, whether under Trump or, or, or Obama and Bush before him, reflect that reality? This gets into the policy question. Yeah. Let's get um, into policy. But I would say that uh, our counterterrorism strategy writ large has very little to do with the grievances on the ground. And we may pay lip service to it in our... Uh, national counterterrorism strategy, and in our country strategies where we're, look, where we're asking for a whole-of-government approach, we talk about various pillars, one being strengthening security forces so that they can secure the country, and the second usually being a, you know, having the government start to develop institutions and capacity, and then the third tends to be something along humanitarian relief, and this is just general for countries that have a terrorism problem. That all sounds well and good, but these are countries that have very few resources. And they, many of them actually rely on foreign assistance to operate their budgets, uh, not just the United States, but also European donors. Uh, and in some cases, uh, China or Russia will help out as well. But the challenge that you have is when you are a poor country with few resources and very little legitimacy among a wide segment of your population, you end up having a massive threat to your regime if there's any insurgency. And so any mobilization with arms is a direct threat. The way to deal with that has been historically through the use of security forces. Not only that, 
dealing with the grievances, very hard. There's a reason why they still exist and why they have persisted. Because I guarantee you that any president or ruler of a country who sees a problem that is easy to fix will fix it. Um, the calculations then come down to retaining access to foreign assistance and ensuring that Western donors are placated, uh, which usually means ensuring that a military confrontation of a threat is prioritized in the budget as well over the enduring problems that are going to be expensive, won't yield immediate results, don't solve the, secu the, the immediate security threat, and also, at times, may actually undercut the strength of the current government. So there are very few incentives for the governments today to actually be pursuing the strategies that they will need to to address these grievances. Do you have the same critiques from your time uh, in <coughs> government? Yeah, I can be a little bit more freer now. So I, <laughs> what, what I would say is that, the, you know, AFRICOM's, uh, one of the sort of objectives, central objectives of AFRICOM is to work with foreign partners. And, you know, during the Bush administration, uh, Bush II, Condi Rice was pushing for this idea of transformational diplomacy, where African nations who are on the ground working side by side, and they are uh, sort of grabbing themselves from the bootstraps, this is sort of the short version of it, and working in concert with Western nations in the case of the U.S. I think that um, the partner engagement is more important than ever. Uh, the United States, the distance where we are, the, the, the fact of the matter of AFRICOM is located, the, the combatant command that's responsible for Africa, it's based in Germany, that we're not able to get to the continent quick enough. Even if we have smaller special operation entities, we have to have the capacity or support the capacity on the ground with our partners. The Senegalese and their gendarmerie um, are considered some of the best, better uh, militaries in the region. Uh, the Ghanaians aren't too bad too as well. The Kenyans are strong CT partners. Um, I think as much as possible if we can work with our, our, our friends, our allied friends who are on the ground, we may not agree on every topic, but at least on the CT fr front and at least dealing with the issue of Salafi extremism or Islamist extremism, that we might, I think that that's a great way for us to see long-term long sustainability. Um, otherwise, and this will probably get into something we'll get into a bit later, we leave it up for chance for other competitors to occupy the, occupy the Africa space. Pick any Gulf nation, they're on the continent of Africa, and they're providing real assistance. The Russians have now established a plan to build a naval amphibious base off in Eritrea. We were talking earlier about in Djibouti. Everyone's running around there. And it's also a money maker too as well for many of these African nations. The fact of the matter, you know, many of these nations received their independence in the 60s and so they're certainly uh, still building capacity. It's a slow process. They're still putting rule of law. There's a few glimmers of hope of certain nations that are quite exciting to see their, their change and their empowering younger generations. You look at Ethiopia as just being one. But what I would say to you is we have to find a way where we are staying involved in the fight. Otherwise, we're leaving it up for chance for any of the Gulf states, and certainly the Chinese are, are there. And the Chinese are very skilled to provide the CT assistance as well at low cost with the loan assistance, of course. So what's the Chinese end game and the Russian end game and the Gulf states? Well, I think the Chinese end game is um, there's a surplus of individuals uh, from mainland China, and the plan is to build as many Chinatowns in every African capital and small town as possible. And those individuals who are coming to the continent of Africa are planning to stay. So that shows you the long haul, the long term game that the Chinese see, and they see Africa as being big business, um, and that they see that African nations are willing to play ball and they're willing to do it, this, and looking and turning, um, particularly Chinese, turning a blind eye to any human rights issues. So I think the Chinese are certainly uh, big players on a block. Um, there was an interesting joke, but you know the Chinese helped build the African Union facility in Ethiopia, and it probably was bugged um, in every aspect and every corner possible. But the Chinese are certainly willing to stay the long haul, and I think for the foreseeable future, um, in light of just the political dynamics of should we be in Africa, should we not, I think that the Chinese will certainly be there to stay. Um, the Russians, I think, are just sort of 
um, trying to get as many deals as possible um, in light of just uh, their weaponry just being deficient and they're just not able to keep up with uh, other competitors. Um, I think that the Russians are just that the fact that they have a presence in East Africa or growing their presence is just a um, just a, a relevancy game. How is the influx of, in the case of China, Chinese populations, how is that received by the African communities that they, they end up in? I mean, is, there any, is there any sort of blowback in terms of you know, uh, grievances or, or not feeling heard because jobs are going to them or whatever yeah. that would look like? So I think, you know, for example, you know, whether you're in East Africa, let's just use uh, Kenya, for example, or Tanzania. Um, you know, many of the contracts that are, be, are, that are being worked out, it's also being, uh, certainly providing opportunities and resources and critical infrastructure from African nations, but it's given to Chinese contractors too as well. And I think that many, there's uh, just anecdotally speaking too as well, there are many individuals who are on the African continent who are unemployed, who are looking for jobs and illiteracy rates, and they want to be able to work. And so how do you, how do you wrestle through this? And it's not an easy, um, it's not an easy thing to, to reconcile. And I think that um, African nations and particularly leaderships are uh, they're hearing that pushback between individuals who have advanced degrees or they have a college educated degree, but they're not able to get the jobs and they also see you know, these roads that are being constructed. I will just add to as well, throughout West Africa, East Africa, um, and certain places in North Africa where the Chinese are building infrastructure, um, the, the level of can these big projects, well, are they lasting? So they're building roads, but are these roads sustainable? So, you know, I would put out a statement five years ago to say that the Americans, we should have been building an Eisenhower plan uh, effort all throughout the continent of Africa connecting roads. This would have been great effort using a model with the Army Corps of Engineers and American <coughs> businesses would have been on the continent. The Chinese got that model but they're using deficient products. And so what happens? It's the dependency syndrome where then African nations have to go back to them to go clean that up. And so you hear about subway connectivity between Nairobi and Mombasa, but who's the operator of the train, oper of the train service? It's a Chinese um, um, uh, contractor. And so you can hear within that the sort of the paradox, the struggle of African nations who are able to uh, to empower themselves who are able to have the long-term sustainability. And I think that's, that's really the big question mark of where this goes. Add that, and that becomes an interesting sort of uh, uh, cocktail for radicalization. I didn't say radicalization down the path of just Islamist agenda, but radicalization toward just vigilante justice or vigilante uh, activity or just criminal activity. Compound that and toward an Islamist agenda that might be very attractive, and you have interesting formulas or interesting packages that are being created there too as well. And I think for us, this is certainly a concern in light of um, um, just economic uh, uh, changes that are happening on the continent, and the fact that we have U.S. businesses that are certainly seeing Africa as a viable place. So it's not just the hardcore military uh, concerns that the U.S. government or U.S. entities should be concerned about. It's the soft power. How about Radisson Blue? How about Hilton? that are occupying throughout various places on the African continent that individuals want to travel and visit, that becomes a concern as well. Have we seen any impact of our policy on radicalization and recruitment? I'm thinking travel ban or some of President Trump's rhetoric around African countries. Um, has there been any change or has that not really sort of had an effect um, across the ocean? Honestly, I think that I haven't seen much of a change um, in terms of how U.S. policy has played out on the ground inside of Africa in the beginning of the Trump administration. African officials who came to Washington were complaining about not having anybody to meet with, and I had to tell them that it wasn't just them. It was literally everyone had no one to meet with in the Trump administration because we didn't have people filling the slots. Um, that's starting to change, and I think that the African nations are recognizing this. I think there's a lot of space to grow, though. So with the emphasis on near-peer competition, with China and Russia and Iran and um, kind of expanding out, all three are playing in the African space. So we had a good lay down of the China, uh, China effort in, in Africa. Russia and, and Putin is really playing this game smartly. He's taken a page back out of the Cold War handbook and is targeting African resources that will affect US companies where, especially the resources 
that have very limited deposits. Um, I'm thinking mineral deposits here. Uh, Putin is actively targeting the sites for these. He is also establishing relationships to rebuild the Soviet basin, so not just the naval base that was mentioned uh, off the coast of Ethiopia, but also looking at Libya. Why does Libya matter to the United States? It matters because it's actually affecting our European partners, and the flow of migrants out of Libya into southern Europe is destabilizing. The fact that a Russian company now controls parts of the gas and oil supply out of Libya puts, puts pressure on Italy, for example, in terms of its deals that it's going to, to cut um, and starts to break apart EU and NATO to some degree, which is an objective for Putin. And we aren't contesting the Russian presence inside of Africa. We're not contesting the Chinese presence. And we're not really recognizing the Iranian presence inside of the continent. Hezbollah uses a smuggling network that Al-Qaeda also uses, and many others, um, that runs from Western Africa across to North Africa. And that's how you know, stolen cars from the United States end up inside of the Middle East. Uh, it's through Africa. There's been Iranian outreach to Shia in Nigeria. Um, there's, there was a recent flare-up, for example, and the United States did very little to capital, capitalize upon this. Um, the leader of a Shia group inside of Nigeria has been imprisoned, um, and his followers are, are calling for charges to be, to be brought against him and for rule of law to be processed. And then, you know, we continue to see very small plots from the IRGC that run through the Horn of Africa from a diaspora that's there. And it's, you know, frankly, the administration, and it's not unique to this administration, seems to have forgotten about Africa. I would just add to as well, just to, on the great point with Sheikh Zakzaki, who's the cleric that is locked up, is that you know you have large amounts of um, uh, Lebanese diasporic populations that are in West Africa that have been there for uh, well half a um, uh, over fifty years plus, um, and and I think that this is interesting too as well because they used the Nigerian example. There is a proxy war also going on in that continent, and there are Shia. Uh, Saudi old world um, tensions between Tehran and also Riyadh and that connectivity with Sheikh Zakzaki and his followers who have then received religious training to go study in Qom or Isfahan in Iran are then coming back into Nigeria and certainly within West Africa. What's happening, they're bringing with them sort of an interpretation that they've studied for three, five, uh, six years in the Hausa, the religious equivalent um, of, or, or, or of a Shia religious uh, uh, place of learning. Um, and so you have the Saudis that have been in, on the continent for 50 years, just like they've been in the United States, and they have created and provided what they saw as an interpretive tradition of Islam of more of a conservative viewpoint. And so West Africa, as a student studying in West Africa, seeing pictures of, um, in college of Osama bin Laden on top of a uh, taxi, or a van was not uncommon. The amount of mosques that have flourished in light of Saudi funding activity has been going on uh, for, for, for quite some time. And so I think that you see the African space as this competition between many different ideological interpretations. And many African uh, community members that have, you know, quite frankly, economics has, has been part of the driving force. If you need a religious place and a religious center and you're looking for assistance, you go to someone who provides that. Um, and, but, but at the same time, it challenges that traditional centuries ways of Islamic being or, uh, or the way of Islamic practice that has been occupying that space for well over um, hundreds of years. And so there's this tension between those who have studied at Islamic University Medina, where they studied in Saudi, or someone who studied at um, X, Y, and Z location in Iran, and then those, once they return back home, telling individuals at the local population that the way you've been practicing, the way your cultural practice and values is in some way deficient because when you, what we've gotten is sort of the truth. So this sort of absolutist sort of rhetoric, I think has caused interesting sort of changes and dynamics within the African space. And I think African communities are struggling with, you know, where does this go forward? And I think you, could, you can pick any of the 54 African nations, and in some shape or fashion, they've engaged with this. So I want to sort of spend the, you know, the next 10 minutes or so as we, before we go to questions about this idea of radicalization. Um, you know, what gets 
you know, typically not always, but typically young men to join these causes? I mean, is it ideological or is it transactional? Because it, you know, some people are giving up very comfortable lives to join these. Um, and so I'm just curious, and sort of speaks to your work. Quilly, I'm just sort of, what does that process look like? So there's no one profile. I mean, during my government days, I used to say, oh, you know, radicalization is, is sort of a, we work now to declassify. There's a radicalization primer circulating somewhere out in the, in, in the ether. And the, the, the journey in and out of extremists is individualized. We've learned that for sure. And that process of radicalization, particularly working in the National Counterterrorism Center, it, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's highly individualized. And the profile is not one person. I uh, used the example of uh, Boko Haram. The, between the period of 2014 and 2018, they were able to uh, employ, and I call it exactly that, employ 450 female suicide bombers. So that's the use of women. Mm. Terrorist organizations are able to adapt. They are able to recognize they need to tap into different groups of people to carry out and execute their aims. And so it's men, it's young boys, it's children, it's providing ideological incentives, it's providing financial incentives. Um, ideology isn't everything, but ideology does play a part, particularly on the continent of Africa. Um, and I think that there's a wonderful study, if you get an opportunity to look at, um, put out by the UN, it was a two-year study um, called The Journey In and Out of Extremism. And one of the things, takeaways, was that 57% of the respondents um, said that they had very little to no understanding of religion. It's no different than in Belgium. Their level of religiosity, understanding how religion works, in this case, Islam, very basic level of understanding. If anything, they probably were partying the night before and someone uh, sort of imposed with them on uh, some sort of guilt, um, Muslim guilt, Christian guilt, whatever that guilt is. And so I think that what we've seen, I think, on the African continent is different sort of profiles, Boko Haram being able to use women, um, young boys, um, it just shows you the adaptive nature. It's not just the spectacular attacks. It's the small scale attacks that show fear and intimidation that target different soft targets as well as hard targets. And I think that right there just shows you uniqueness, particularly on the continent of Africa. And to be frank with you, I, I've, I've moved past the stage of saying, um, it's not if an attack will take place, it's just when. And I think that's just the reality of where we are, and particularly on the continent, we're likely seeing an increase. The fact that I'm still gainfully employed, having left the IC three, two years ago, two and a half years ago, and we have more work that I can even take on, just shows you the level of the seriousness of what we're engaged in. We're working with former extremists now. Um, our organization, whether we're in Africa, we're in, we work domestically in the US, we also work on the African continent, and we have individuals who are former Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is like BlackBerry, past tense. ISIS is iPhone. What's next? And so I think these are sort of real questions that we all were, were constantly wrestling with. And then once you incarcerate someone, what sort of assistance are they receiving in prison? I can tell you it's the same story that we're struggling right here in the United States, that when we travel and we're doing work in Nigeria, or I have team members who are in Somalia right now, is that they may not be receiving real assistance while they're locked up. And that's the type of assistance they need. They need to get radical rehab rehabilitation. That rehabilitation is very specific. It's very tailored. It's a mentor. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's providing a job. It's providing them um, a wife or a husband. I mean, it's a very, it's a roll your sleeve up type of work. And lastly, what I will say, some of it is very existential. So it will not be solved in one year. It will not be solved in three years. This is a very long-term fight. I hate to be pessimistic, but, but I think that we, one has to be very realistic to the reality that we're, le that we're dealing with and also within the African space, the response of also um, community members who might not receive them well once they come back home. I mean, to that point, I mean, it's in terms of the, the nuance and how much work this is, you Glenn put out a report um, earlier this year, I think, on a, now a man, he was a boy, his name Muhammad Khalid, yeah. uh, who raised in the UAE, moves to Pakistan, comes to the United States, um, has loving family who values education, who struggled to put him, to, you know, send him to private school, 
um, ends up at the end of high school getting into Johns Hopkins, and he's also the youngest person ever to be convicted of terrorism in the United States um, for plotting to kill a, a Swedish artist, I think. Yeah. And he talks, he's very articulate, and I think, yeah. I think he's one of the people that you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Um, he's reflective about his time, and there's not any one thing that sort of took him down that path. He yeah. talks about, actually talks about 9-11 as this moment where these grievances were raised. He talks about social media and online communities, um, about feeling that the move to the United States being difficult for him. But just underscores how difficult that process is because it's just so tailored to every individual person. You know, we have, uh, finally, we have Shameless Plug. We have a Vice uh, special that will be coming out on him. And we've been working with it. He reached out to us via snail mail while he was incarcerated in, in a U.S. prison. Youngest person, as you mentioned, in U.S. history, indicted on terrorism charges. And I can tell you, the individual we work with, he's not the only one. People are returning home. And some people are just as hardened right now uh, as they went in. And so the response is very specific. He engages with us regularly. I communicate it with him as well because I think it's important too as well not to just go sort of 50,000 foot strategic but also rolling up my sleeve to, be able to understand the trends um, and hear what is this frustration. Um, and I, I can tell you it, it, it's not an easy task particularly um, and, and add that layer within the United States, we have some structures in place and we do have some techniques just like we need to respond to or we've responded to gang issues or individuals who have been incarcerated, former drug dealers, and we can use some of those good practices. I don't say best practices because if they were best, we would have already won the fight. They're good practices that we can learn throughout the world and we can find those strategies for, uh, for the future. But um, on the African continent, context, imagine limited infrastructure, limited budgets, um, ideology that is on the increase, and, um, and then so many other variables, um, health issues, et cetera. Um, it's, it becomes very complicated. Um, and I think the response to it requires a lot more sophistication that I find myself constantly trying to get creative um, and with my team too as well we're constantly coming with and trying to be as creative as possible so that we can provide you know the best form of, of, of tailored response for individuals who need assistance last thing I'll say to you as well is there's a mental health component um, at least in the United States you can get the assistance you have mental health challenges that are happening on the continent of Africa that people are not getting the proper diagnos uh, diagnostics for it ahead of time and as you know, prevention is where all of this is. Um, kicking the doors in the, you know, kicking in the doors, um, heavy CT kinetic activity, that's great for the short term, um, but the prevention efforts is really where we all have to engage in for, the, for really sort of our biggest bang for our buck. And uh, that's the work we've been doing. Our organization is made up of former extremists themselves. And I have more former extremists right here in the U.S. And on the Af continent of Africa, we're getting the same request. So it's, it's, it's not going away. Is it hard to get buy-in from those communities for this work? I mean, just be, being so tailored and sort of working with individuals who um, now might be, you know, persona non grata, obviously coming back. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's the difficult task, is that communities are struggling, like, what is their position? Um, I've been in many focus groups, whether in Tanzania, uh, in, in Kenya, or in other places in West Africa, and communities are, just like in South Africa, there was a peace and reconciliation. Communities at the local level are struggling. Should we have a peace and reconciliation dealing with post-terrorism? When the threat is still going, or, or the, the threats are constantly coming in. Can you, can you have that? I mean, so these, um, I, don't, I don't know if we all have the answers. I think we are all testing throughout the world and international community, and... Um, and only time will tell. Is there reason for optimism? Absolutely. Uh, we have to be optimistic. Uh, my, uh, one of the dean of, I would classify him as a dean of African studies, uh, Islamic studies in America, who taught me at, when I was doing my doctoral work at Howard, he passed away Monday, Dr. Suleiman Yang. And he had an affection, just a, a beautiful smile, and he would say, we have to be eternally optimistic. Um, if we're not, who else is going to do the work for us? 
So I think all of us have to play our part. The fact that we're on sacred grounds right now, hollow grounds, is indicative of just the work and the fact that this room is filled with individuals seeing that the, the issue of violent extremism on the African continent is, is still a concern. And I will say to you that if you don't think that this is important or has a connectivity to the US, I would say think again. We had an individual by the name of Malik Jones from Baltimore, Maryland, um, who wanted to travel to Al-Shabaab. We've had a number of individuals who were in Colorado. And pick your location in the United States. And they have wanted to provide assistance and travel to what they see as and support organizations. And so you know, terrorist groups are able to, they now have slick videos, no more grainy uh, sort of uh, tactics in terms of their videography. They're able to definitely use attractive appeal and approaches, and I think that um, we're likely going to see an increase. in the, the real concern is, you know, what's next? Um, I'm, I'm sure you probably would, would, would say the same thing, particularly Islamic State in West Africa. We talk about this, but what's next? Yeah, I, I, I think I have to echo your optimism. Um, I need to work myself out of a job at some point. Yeah. Um, do want to retire. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I'm... I'm engaged in an effort right now to try to put forward a new strategy to counter the global Salafi Jihadi movement, which obviously has a very strong footprint in Africa. It's been forgotten in Africa for over a decade, but people you know, need to remember that the 1998 embassy bombings were Al-Qaeda's first real cry on the continent of Africa. Um, you can look at Black Hawk Down, uh, the, the links to Al-Qaeda are a little bit uh, sketchier than, mm -hmm. than Al-Qaeda would like us to believe. but the the space now is there and there are interesting opportunities across the u.s government uh, with ngos as well and with partner nations and other groups on the ground to start addressing these issues and to start addressing them in new ways because everyone recognizes that what we're doing today is failing and that is not just me being a pessimist that's me saying that this is actually a time when people are talking about what we could be doing which is a great moment to be in. And at the Defense Department, the special operators who have been on the ground inside of Africa will tell you that they are not the solution, that they are relied upon very heavily. Uh, they were relied upon by the Bush administration, by the Obama administration, now by the Trump administration to keep us safe. And they will continue to do their job, but they are not the answer. They will tell you it is the State Department and USAID that will eventually lead to the answer because they are the ones who will be able to deliver the governance that people seek. And so it's changing how we're thinking about it. And you know, we can critique what we did. The freedom agenda was problematic because it was pushing our version of democracy on communities that already really had representative governance. Um, the Obama administration talked about CVE over counterterrorism. So CVE, countering violent extremism, was the new but is still the new buzzword. And the idea is that it's a non-kinetic, non-military solution to radicalization. But the Obama administration talked a big game and put a lot of money into counterterrorism. And the CVE was never really employed the way that it could have been, should have been, and it's gotten a name of failure. Um, also defining what precisely it is is another open question, mm. because if you're countering violent extremism without the military, that can go everywhere from the de-radicalization programs that we, that we have and that are effective to taking it down, a little bit down the line to actually starting to build governance, uh, which I think is where the solution lies. Um, the other place is that, you know, as we start to see how interconnected the threats are and the problems are inside of the African continent from the smuggling to terrorism to the absence of government governance to the humanitarian concerns, there is actually a very, very large community of interest here in the United States and abroad that is unified in wanting a much better life for people in these countries. And to do away with a lot of the grievances um, or the conflicts that have allowed Salafi Jihadi groups in particular to flourish. So, you know, as we're looking at that, there is optimism. That being said, what's next is I think that we're looking at another couple of years in the same thing, which means that we're watching a Shabab re-expand. Uh, in Somalia. We're watching the Islamic State in, in Nigeria 
outcompete Boko Haram from which it's splintered uh, because it's using, interestingly enough, some very Al Qaeda like strategies uh, and incorporating itself into local communities and winning support uh, by fighting and framing itself as defending communities against the pillaging Nigerian army, which has some truth to it. And you, know, you can watch this, and in the Sahel, it's expanding where Burkina Faso now has a terrorism threat and a legitimate one. It was growing a couple of years ago, and it's realized today. And that was not without warning. Experts were warning, the military was warning, the State Department knew it was happening on. We didn't resource anything to help prevent this. Uh, and we now have a much bigger problem. So, you know, as we're talking about drawing down our resources and spending abroad, you know, we really don't spend that much of our budget abroad. The State Department budget is basically zero. Um, and USAID, very close to that. Even our defense budget is really, really small percentage-wise in terms of what we're doing, and we could better allocate it. Um, but when we talk about the ramifications here at home, improving, improving Africa, improving the governance of Africa does a lot for the United States. It secures us in a more permanent fashion, but it also opens up all of those markets that U.S. companies have been eyeing for many decades, but I've been loath to go into because the, secu the security cost is so high. And there is kind of a new age that could come once we get the security issues dealt with in Africa, and those link back to many of the governance issues. So with that, um, let's open it up to the audience uh, for questions. Um, with the lights turned on, and then for the mic um, to find you um, before you ask the question, please. So, yeah, right in the middle here. First thing I'd say is, as a, a global studies teacher in a local high school, I always think of this situation when I teach about the Marshall Plan and how efficacious that was, and how perhaps it's time for that or something to that effect. But my, my question, aside from that, is can you single out one winner among African governments in addressing this? Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast, is Cote d'Ivoire. Is there a, a, a positive uh, player among these governments that could be singled out as a really good example of what to do? Well, I'll say this. I mean, I'll just use the recent example I brought up with Ethiopia because I think Abiy Ahmed um, offers some really interesting, exciting optimism that everyone is, is uh, both in, in on the continent of Africa and those who are in the diaspora and certainly right in the United States in terms of his reforms that he's been advocating for. You have to look at the context. This is a nation that was a strong CT partner, but very closed off. He inherits and makes a strong decision to say, I'm going to appoint as my prime minister a female, a woman. I'm going to diversify and include a cross section of my population that's Muslim, Christian, different ethnicity group, ethnic groups. And he makes a powerful statement to the Ethiopian diaspora population in Washington, which is the largest outside of Ethiopia, and says, uh, and this is a fascinating statement that ties into the whole Salafi jihadism. He says that, uh, that the UAE um, leadership um, essentially told him that uh, they wanted to teach his community Islam. Abi Ahmed is a Christian leader of a very diverse Muslim, Christian, and other African traditional religions. And he responded and I think it really is testimony to where we're at. And I'm excited about what happens and we're all watching. He says, we do not need the Middle East to teach us Islam. We just need to send a few individuals to study Arabic, master, come back home, and create our own form of Ethiopian Islam that's moderate and tolerant. And I think that's a really interesting sort of testimony of a society that's very religious, Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity is certainly uh, very, uh, is sort of the predominant form of Christianity there. And here he is trying to lead the way in some reformation. He also works to resolve a, a age-old issue between Eritrea 
that finally the borders are opened up. So I think Ethiopia is, I just use that as, as just, I'm excited about wh where that goes. Cautious optimism is what I will use. Um, you know, some of the other West African nations seem hopeful. Senegal is, you know, I spent a lot of time there and I use them as a good example. They've been able to create sort of a moderate interpretation and they've been able to buffer against a lot of forms of extremism. Um, I think Tunisia has some interesting hopes, sort of esque. Um, I think there's there's a few nations that are around the continent, but I think there's not one singular nation that's sort of doing it as a model, um, in my estimation. I don't know what you think. No, I would agree, and I think that there are parts that are, that different nations are doing better than others, and what we don't have is kind of every working part in one single nation. <coughs> And a lot of that comes back to the, the challenges that the state actually faces, the, the at-home challenges. Um, so Kenya, for example, a phenomenal counterterrorism partner in terms of what the Kenyans are doing. But the politics in Kenya have actually driven divisions within the Kenyan state uh, that have increased some conflict and have allowed al-Shabaab to recruit further inside of the, the country. So while the security forces and the counterterrorism apparatus has improved, we also are watching an improved recruitment base, um, so you kind of have a chicken and egg situation going on inside of Kenya. Um, when we're looking at other states, Niger is one that rarely gets mentioned. Um, it's a state that is literally challenged on nearly all of its borders by instability, where it, is, it borders Mali, and it borders a part of Mali that has been under an insurgency for the past six years. It borders Libya. Um, there's not many people on that Libyan border, but um, it is part of the flow of traffic into Mali. And it also borders uh, to the south, it borders Nigeria. And Boko Haram has used that borderline very specifically to avoid Nigerian security forces. Um, so what Niger has managed to do has been to hold on, which sounds so terrible when you frame it that way. Um, but it is a small state with few resources and facing three different security threats including ones that are inside of the country. Uh, and the state has not collapsed. And a lot of that has to do with dedication from the Nigerian government to survive, and to survive in a way that uh, means that it will have robust legitimacy going forward. So it has participated in counter smuggling. It's changed, actually, how it does counter smuggling to the point where human traffickers have, have had difficulty going through Niger. Um, this has ramifications in terms of the migrant flow from sub-Saharan Africa up into North Africa. And it has done so without really stoking a lot of unrest within the country. We have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, right here. Just wait for the uh, microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, words this evening. Foreign terrorist organizations, uh, groups that have a transnational threat, they don't just emerge out of the ether. They often grow from local threats. And it seems like there's a paradox where we see these local threat-posing organizations, and they're perceived that way, and resources then don't follow them accordingly. You have both alluded to two attacks uh, you know, this evening. The attack uh, specifically in Burkina Faso um, that took place last year, and also in Niger where we lost uh, several special forces last year. Of these two groups, Islamic State in the Greater Sahara and JNIM, do you think that their lack of an external operations capability, their lack of attacks overseas, is a function of strategic restraint of actually avoiding that type of action, or is it a function of a lack of capability, a lack of resources? I have a paper coming out, I believe this week, uh, that argues that these groups have adapted in part to the current conditions, but also to our counterterrorism policy. <laughs> And our policy has been to attack those terrorist groups that have attacked us or are threatening us, which means that we have actually seen decisions by groups to not develop an external attack node. And that has been a very clear decision. We have it from documents captured yeah. in Osama bin Laden's compound. We have it in guidance from Ayman al-Zawahiri, who's the leader of al-Qaeda, to his deputy inside of Syria. And we have it elsewhere as, as well specifically saying, do not conduct an attack and draw attention to yourself today because you are a key support base. And it's that linkage that you alluded to between the local support and the global jihad that is so dangerous to the United States. And the fact that our policy 
segments the two and only targets this external threat node and kind of allows our partner governments on the ground to go after the local means that we are going to face continued threats. Um, as we're looking at this, we need to recognize that within the ideology, there's actually no fire break between the individuals who are focused on the local jihad and those that are focused on the global. They're complementary in terms of what they do. And in nearly all cases, when a global jihadi organization has asked or requested for support from a local base, it has received it. And so for us to say, well, you know, Al-Shabaab can, can govern Somalia because it's not directly threatening the United States, that's a problem. Um, because Al-Shabaab has exported its jihad into Kenya. It has put a bomb on a plane, which gets forgotten about many, many times. It put two on a plane, only managed to kill the bomber. Um, but these are groups that are actively looking to export eventually. And it's that timeline and the fact that um, it's really, really hard to predict when a group that has all the capacities, the attack capacities at home, will turn them abroad um, that makes these such a threat. So when you think about what it requires to conduct an external attack, a lot of that is nested within the local organization. You need the media arm in order to talk about it. Almost all organizations, actually all organizations have a media arm today, and many of them, as, as Muhammad noted, are quite, quite good. Um, you need the training and the recruiting and the vetting. All of that is within the local organization. Uh, developing bomb expertise, by God, that's also there, especially if they're using uh, vehicle-borne IEDs, which are more complicated to make, so car bombs effectively, than just a, a roadside bomb. And you know the fact that Al-Qaeda and now the Islamic State has put a lot of their expertise online makes it accessible. And you can walk through those requirements, and all of a sudden you get to, by God, it comes down to just a decision point. And I will tell you that the United States has actually missed that decision point nearly every time. Um, so considering the local dynamics and you know being able to differentiate between govern governance that is Islamist versus governance that is Salafi jihadist is going to be really, really critical for us <coughs> because we need to be clear that our issue are with groups that espouse a Salafi jihadi ideology, that espouse an ideology that requires them to fight and to expand and to do so through violence. If they reject violence, then we might still see them as adversarial and should not be supporting them um, because at many of their governance is illiberal. But we should not actually call them enemies because to do so moves them along that spectrum. Any last one? I, I would just add everything she said. I agree. Um, I think that you, you, we're now at a point where, and you brought up this is important, I mean, the distinction between Islamists and Salafi jihadists, and that nuanced nature. I mean, we define, you know, Islamism as an individual who has a strict or narrow interpretation of Islam. You go to Tunisia, the Nahda party with Rashid Ganoushi is a perfect example of someone who says, I want to be part of the political mainstream, but I label myself as an Islamist. He has a strict interpretation of Islam, but he's not a Salafi jihadist that seeks to impose uh, his force by violence, and wanting to go back to what he considers a 7th century interpretation of Islam in the 21st century, or maybe having a 21st century wife, but him being a 7th century man. Disconnect. So um, I think that we are now at a point where we are fleshing out this terminology. And before we came um, out here, I was, we're now confronted with the reality of post-Salafism. There is conversation, there is tensions that are taking place in the broader jihadi space of what it means to, in not just jihadi space, but also Salafi community, what does it mean when we talk about Salafism? And what does it mean for individuals who think that the Salafi jihadis have gone way too far? So some of this gets into really like really technical, uh, dorky, policy wonk items. But I think really for individuals who are in, 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 this, in our circle, in our orbit, the general public, this is all serious business, particularly as it relates to the African continent as well, because we see the spaces just being pervasive and they're, they're able to occupy in light of uh, government uh, or the lack of government structures in some places too as well. Finally, I'll just say too as well, both in Niger and Chad, you have an under 35 population, there's roughly about 
give or take, right? It's a pretty large amount. What do you do when you have an under 35 population that's the majority of the population? They're very vulnerable. You can't have jobs and resources. Niger and Chad are both countries that are some of the most poorest countries on this planet Earth. So you can hear some of the, the challenges that are being worked out. They are making good strides. Both Mohammed Isafu and Idris Debi, they're, they're doing their best, but they need to have term limits as well. So add that dynamic. Add uh, you have an extremist agenda that's moving into as well. And uh, you were cautiously optimistic. I'll leave it there. Well, let's leave it on that note. We definitely do dorky uh, policy wonks, so you've come to the right place yes. for that. But thank you so much. <laughs> Um, for coming tonight. It's been a wonderful conversation. I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, and thank, uh, thank our two uh, panelists here. Thank you very much.